All right. This is a massive one for me, friends. If you've heard me talk about broadcasting, my inspirations, my reasons for wanting to do this, you have heard me talk about Bob Costas. He's the reason why I went to Syracuse University. Uh, one of two or three reasons why I wanted to do this job to begin with. Uh, I used to emulate him as a kid on the uh, on the basketball court with my friends. Uh, I didn't want to be the athletes. I wanted to be Bob Costas. So it is surreal for me to say right now, it is a great pleasure to be joined for the first time on any kind of program that I've ever hosted by the one and only, the inimitable, the incomparable, arguably the greatest, if not the greatest of all time, Bob Costas. Bob, thank you so much for this. It really means a lot to me. After that introduction, all I can do is disappoint. How does anybody live up to that? Well, uh, I think you can, and I know you can, and uh, I, I can, I, again, like I said off air, uh, don't want to shower you with too much praise and uh, embarrass you, but this one really means a lot. And in fact, uh, the reason why I said this is the first time we are speaking on air, it's because we've actually met once before. There's no chance that you recall this conversation, if you want to call it that, but I'll, I'll tell you the quick story. Um, I went to Syracuse, I went to Newhouse, and I would always get very excited when, you know, famous broadcasters who went to Newhouse would come to speak to the students. Uh, mm -hmm. You came, I believe, in 2004 it was, and uh, I'm, believe it or not, uh, a massive, or was, a massive Montreal Expos fan. I was one of the few left because I'm from Montreal. I was a huge baseball fan. And I mustered up the courage to ask you at the end of your talk to the students if you thought baseball could be saved in Montreal. That was my question to you. And you shut me down so fast. I mean, I, it, my, my head was spinning. Uh, you pretty much said no, and you said it was a lost cause. And so a part of me was thrilled that I finally got to ask Bob Costas' question. Uh, the fan in me, the, the Expos fan, the baseball fan, was heartbroken. So that was the first time. Hopefully this chat goes a little better. Well, maybe this will make you feel better because I really think if they get, it's a big if, if they get a new stadium bill, nothing like the monstrosity for baseball of the old Olympic Stadium, there is a chance that when baseball expands, you could make a good case for Montreal. They would have a natural rivalry of course with toronto they'd have a rivalry at least geographically uh with boston uh the yankees could be in that division it would make sense um geographically and for divisional realignment if all the other factors were in place and the first and most important factor is uh, a new stadium which is not exactly on the horizon no but i will say that answer a lot more promising than the one you gave me some 19 years ago so i appreciate it very much um of course, this is a basketball program, so uh, we won't focus on the great game of baseball. I uh, wanted to talk to you primarily about your time, you know, uh, covering, hosting, doing play-by-play -play in the world of basketball. And for me, the NBA and NBC is where I fell in love with sports broadcasting. Uh, there was nothing better from the theme, from, from mm -hmm. the production, from the storytelling, from the characters, from the broadcasters, the hosts, the sideline reporters. It had it all. And so if I can ask you this, and I know it was just a 12-year run on NBC, but off the top, why do you think even, you know, some 22 years later, why do you think we hold the NBA on NBC in such high regard. And I don't know, maybe Monday Night Football in the 70s, 80s uh, is, is considered the same way, but there is mm -hmm. nothing on television now that comes close to the NBA on NBC. Why do you think it is still so special to us all these years later? I think the most important part is the era itself in the NBA. It isn't just Michael Jordan, but he's at the heart of it with the six Bulls championships. When you think of the constellation of stars, all around him in the NBA. Elijah Wan's Rockets, Clyde Drexler got in there at the end, but there's also Clyde Drexler's Portland Trailblazers. There's Charles Barkley with the 76ers, and then later with the Suns. There's Malone and Stockton with the Utah Jazz. There's Dominique Wilkins in Atlanta, and on and on. I'm leaving a lot of people out. Think of the dream team uh, in 92, the first and true dream team at the Barcelona Olympics, Scotty Pippen and Michael Jordan on the, are the Bulls on that team. But everybody else on that team, with the exception of Christian Leitner, who was the lone collegiate player, every other player on that team is a Hall of Famer. And Isaiah Thomas wasn't even on the team. Think of Isaiah Thomas's Detroit Pistons and their back-to-back -back championships. So it's the era. You're just getting out of the Kareem um, Magic Johnson era with the Lakers. 
overlapping Larry Bird and the Celtics, and then on to the Bulls. And at the tail end of Michael Jordan's run, which ends with the Bulls in 98, along comes Tim Duncan to team with David Robinson, and the Spurs win their first, followed by Kobe and Shaq to win three in a row. That era was just fabulous. Then add to it, and leave me out of it, but I think it's fair. Your analysis is correct. The quality of the production, the direction, and the overall presentation of the NBA on NBC was as good as the presentation of any sport in the history of sports television. And it also was all, essentially, on network TV. Did TNT or TBS have a piece of it at that time? Sure, and I guess there were some games on ESPN. But the biggest games were on over-the-air broadcast television before that landscape changed as dramatically as it has to the fractionalized media world we have today, network television still had primacy. Primetime hits today that are considered successes would have very small ratings alongside Seinfeld or Cheers or ER or Friends or anything else that was a hit, let's say, in the 90s. And so with the NBA on NBC, the promos for those games were on those top-rated programs. They were on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show and then Jay Leno and on David Letterman and Tom Brokaw's newscast and the Today Show. It was just more a part of the overall culture. It wasn't just basketball junkies. It was the average casual fan. And of course, then there was Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had a quality. You know, you can compare other players with him statistically, but the combination of Michael Jordan's undeniable objective excellence and achievements coupled with his star quality and how appealing he was to watch with him as your leading man and all of these great supporting players. And then the combination of that and the television landscape and what NBC did with that television landscape. I don't think you'll ever have that combination of factors again. All of it peaked. Uh, It couldn't have been any better. So, of course, um, you were a host in studio on site and also had um, the run as lead play-by-play guy, which role did you Mm -hmm. prefer the most? Well, I thought that the best use of our overall roster was me as the host and Marv Albert as the play-by-play guy. I enjoyed doing play-by-play. I was a little rusty when uh, I began in the 97-98 season with Isaiah Thomas, and he was a complete rookie. He'd never done it before. By mid-season, we'd added Doug Collins, who is arguably the best NBA analyst ever. He was just terrific. And the three of us were better than the two of us, Isaiah and I, had been. Partly that was because I was rusty. I hadn't done much basketball play-by-play in a very long time. And, of course, I was used to a studio role, no matter what the sport might be. When we started in the early 90s, it was Dick Ebersol's idea, I guess because I was the most prominent of NBC's broadcasters, to have me be the lead play-by-play guy. And I actually argued at that time, no, no, Dick, I could do it, and I think I could do it well. But Marv is the voice of basketball. He is in New York, and as soon as he gets on these games on NBC, he will be that voice nationally. And that turned out to be true. And I said, I can help you more in the studio because Pat Riley, in between the Lakers and the Knicks, was going to join our studio team And I think he would have been lost a bit without someone there who was, you know, kind of a steady hand at the wheel. It was easy for me to handle all the traffic and let him just worry about the basketball analysis. So I think we were really stronger up and down with me in the studio or courtside when we did the pregame and postgame from the site during the playoffs. Stronger there and then with Marv doing the play-by-play. When Marv had to step aside for a few years, uh, then I slid into the play-by-play role, and, and that worked out pretty well, too. Considering your relationship with Marv, was that difficult for you? You know, you 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 had this working relationship, you were friends, but he had his issue that he had to deal with, and now you're coming in and replacing him, and, and he was iconic, right? I mean, like, he was mm-hmm. synonymous. Um, you have a job to do, and you're going to go out there, and you did it masterfully, as expected, but internally, was that difficult for you? Not difficult for me. I felt bad for Marv, but since you've asked, this is exactly what happened. Dick Ebersol asked me um, to leave the studio role and do the play-by-play. And I said, Dick, I owe that to you and to NBC, but 
if Marv is ever able to come back, I'm just keeping the seat warm. This is his job. So if he's able to come back, I will step aside. And that's exactly what happened. I did it for three years. And luckily, Marv was able to come back and do the last two years, 2001 and 2002, in a play-by-play role. And of course, uh, and I'm sure you know this, uh, your sign-off um, at the conclusion of the 1998 NBA Finals Game 6, Jordan's last shot before you know retiring and then, of course, coming back again you know, with the Wizard, mm-hmm. with the Wizards, uh, has been passed around. It has millions of views because uh, what you said in that moment seemed to have predicted what was to come in not only basketball, but the business of sports. Are you aware of how famous that clip is now, like on the internet, on YouTube? And uh, also, just curious, was that all off the top of the head or were you reading off a prompter? Because I, I rewatched it last night. Yeah. And, you know, I know you didn't use prompter a lot, um, but it was just amazing how you captured everything in the moment after such, you know, an emotional game. Well, we didn't know how the game would end. And in fact, had the Jazz won the game, then there would have been a game seven uh, a few nights later. That game six is still the highest rated uh, NBA game in history. Imagine what a game seven under those circumstances might have been. But I had a feeling throughout that season, not just in the finals, that this was very possibly the end of the Michael Jordan era, very possibly the end of the Bulls dynasty. So in that sense, this was different than just another NBA final. Uh, They're all important, but this one seemed more significant. I had a sense that if and when it ended, it would be front page news, not just sports page news. So I had all those bullet points in my head. Uh, and then I was able to pull them together since the game did end that night. And Ahmad Rashad uh, did probably 10, 15 minutes of post-game stuff interviewing everybody, uh, at, w- at which time I could pull my thoughts together. And so some of it was on prompter and some of it was extemporaneous. Um, when we were in the uh, the heart of the pandemic, that team obviously enjoyed a, a renaissance. That era enjoyed a renaissance. Um I I would look forward to it every Sunday, right? We had nothing else to look forward to. There were no live sports. Was Bob Costas sitting on his couch Sunday night's appointment television in an era where appointment television hardly exists anymore to watch what you lived, what you were the soundtrack for? I'm sorry, what which games are you referring to? I I kind of I'm sorry, I'm talking about the the, the Last Dance, the documentary. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. First of all, the Last Dance was very well done on its own terms. But as you said, it dropped at a time when there was essentially no live sports. Uh, We're at the beginning of the pandemic, people figuring out how to deal with it. So there's nothing else. I think it would have been highly rated and very much appreciated in any circumstance. But in that circumstance, uh, it garnered an even larger audience. And one of the things that was gratifying for me and for NBC is that so much of what we did during that period of time, more than 20 years before the last dance ended, kind of holds up. I mean, I hadn't even remembered 90% of what I said or what we did or what Marv had said during that era. But I remember at one point, uh, I guess it was game five of the finals, um, the Bulls had a 3-1 lead on the Jazz, and they would have been favored to win game five uh, in Chicago. And instead, Utah won and pushed it back to the Delta Center. But in the lead, as we came on the air and as the Bulls were running out onto the floor, I said something like, if this is the last dance and Phil Jackson had termed it the last dance, uh, the producers of the documentary didn't make that up. He said, this is probably the last dance. So that phrase was kind of out there during the course of the season. And I said, if this is the last dance, it might as well be on their dance floor turned out not to be the case. But my point is, not just me, but all of us, the producers, uh, Ahmad on the sideline, Doug and Isaiah sitting next to me, Dick Ebersole at the top of all of this, we knew we weren't just documenting any single game or any single play or even any single series or season. There was a story to be told here. And the story is of one of the greatest careers in the history of American sports, Michael Jordan, and one of the great dynasties in the history of American sports. And I think we did a very good job of capturing that narrative, not just as it ended, but in everything that led up to it. I actually saw another clip last night of you and Pat Riley 
uh, you were hosting, you were on site, you were in Chicago, you messed up his hair a little bit, mm -hmm. and you messed up your hair. And I think people forgot that Pat had that cup of coffee as a, you know, as a studio analyst before going over to the Knicks. Um, your memories of working with him because he was great he was well spoken and 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 no surprise but it's just not a part of his resume when people talk about all the great things he's done and if, yeah. if i could also ask who were your favorites to work with both in the studio like if you could put together your dream team studio team and then of course in the booth well with all due respect to isaiah whom i like very much and we remain friends he was a novice at it and doug collins had done it before and did it subsequent to that with other partners so I picked Doug to be alongside me uh, calling play-by-play, -play, although we had a lot of other guys like Mike Fratello. I just saw uh, Mike the Czar, the Telestrator, about a week or so ago. I went to a Clippers game against the Warriors where Steph Curry dropped 50, and then uh, Mike and I went out to dinner afterwards. So, you know, Mike was terrific too, but I didn't work with him except for a handful of games uh, in the early 90s. So I picked Doug Collins as the person to be alongside me if I'm calling the game um, in – in the uh, the studio, uh, Pat, to your question, Pat was new to it. Obviously, Pat's a very smart guy. He's a huge part of NBA history, um, and he had a lot of insights. But I think even he would acknowledge he was somewhat restrained, just like Bill Parcells was in between gigs. Parcells knew that when he did television, he wasn't done coaching. And Pat Riley wasn't done coaching either. So he couldn't really let the throttle out. And by that, I don't mean hot takes and shooting from the hip and taking pot shots at people. But sometimes critical observations are called for as long as they're well presented. And I think um, Pat was a little bit restrained when it came to that. And I absolutely cannot blame him. Uh, broadcasting was just a stopover for him. But I enjoyed his company very much and I have great respect for him. Uh, as far as um, those that you worked with in the studio, w was there a pairing or two that you really enjoyed? Well, it wasn't in the studio, uh, although it was for football. Uh, Ahmad Rashad. Mm. I loved everything about working with Ahmad Rashad. We had good personal chemistry. Um, we had a similar sense of humor. We enjoyed lots of laughs, not on the air. And when he did Sideline uh, for the NBA on NBC... I thought he was an enormous asset and an underrated asset. Ahmad has star power. And that's something you can't learn. You can't teach it. You either have it or you don't. He had presence and star power. And players in all sports responded to him in a different way than they would respond to most broadcasters. They felt a certain kinship with him. They enjoyed his company. And so sometimes he'd get criticized. He didn't ask Michael Jordan a hard-hitting question. He didn't have to. The point was that Michael Jordan would always come over to Ahmad Rashad after the game. He was usually the star of the game. Ahmad asked the questions that had to be asked. It wasn't an interrogation. It wasn't 60 minutes. Ahmad's presence on those broadcasts elevated those broadcasts. Plus, he also got information, and he, re and he reported it. Even when he wasn't interviewing a star, he got info. And he reported it during those little segments where we'd quickly throw it to him and he had to get something out in about half a minute and get it back to me or get it back to Marv. He was very, very good. So uh, he, he's the guy I'd pick in answer to that question. When I, when I throw out June 17, 1994, you're, you're a part of that story as well, right? During game five of the NBA finals, yeah. the chase and whatnot. I, you, you could probably write several chapters about that day, but I'm very curious about the buildup to the broadcast what do you remember about everything that was going on behind the scenes? I, I remember in mm -hmm. the uh, 30 for 30, there's some footage of uh, that is fascinating to watch in retrospect of, of you. I think you're talking to one of your producers. We hear your voice. Mm -hmm. They're feeding you information. Could you take us back, if possible, to that day and what you remember? Not so much about what was said on air, but just yeah. there's so much probably craziness going on behind the scenes, in your ear. What comes to mind? Yeah, you're asking all the best questions and the interesting questions um first of all almost all of us involved in the production knew oj simpson personally the murders took place on a sunday night and the first reaction from all of us is what a horrible tragedy for oj and his family then as the next 48 72 hours played out you say to yourself well, wait a minute he is at very least 
a suspect. And maybe the weight of what we know to that point indicates that he committed these murders. And certainly by Friday, which is the day in question, which happened to be game five of the NBA finals at Madison Square Garden between the Rockets and the Knicks, by then he has been charged with the murder and he is fleeing. And so at that point, uh, the Bronco chase on the 405, three hours earlier, late afternoon um, Pacific time, but overlapping game time at Madison Square Garden, the Bronco chase is underway. And every other network is carrying this in full live. Dick Ebersole has to make a decision, and it's a tough one. What do we do? We've got an NBA Finals game. Not just any game. you got an NBA Finals game. Um, and so part of the time, we went to Tom Brokaw. Usually did that during timeouts and certainly at halftime and part of the pregame show. But even during play, sometimes we went to Tom and we'd have a split screen. Tom would be talking over the slow speed Bronco chase. And you wouldn't hear Marv at that point. He's not calling the game. But you would see the visual on the other half of the screen with the score superimposed you could follow the rocks the rockets and the knicks so we had an entirely different kind of surreal presentation when compared to the other networks the thing you have to remember is at that point we don't know how this is going to end he says or ac cowlings his friend who's in the bronco with him says he's got a gun to his head we don't know if he's going to commit suicide we don't know if when they arrive back at his house in brentwood if there might be a violent confrontation in the driveway, we don't know if he's going to give up peacefully or what the heck is going to happen. So all of this is an ongoing drama. And what I'm concerned with as kind of being the intermediary between Marv calling the game and Tom Brokaw handling the journalistic part of it is that I want to strike the right tone. I don't want to sound like, hey, welcome back to the game. You know, on the other hand, I don't want to ignore the game. And as I remember what you see in that documentary, there's a part where I'm trying to say to the producer, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter anymore. Forget that. Forget that. Yeah, I already said I'm Bob Costas. That doesn't matter. Let's just get to the nub of the matter here and, and have me just get it from point A to point B and let Marv and Tom Brokaw do their respective parts. I should also say that a lot of people were personally were personally affected by this uh oj wrote what seemed like a suicide note which was read by one of his attorneys robert kardashian that afternoon and it included references to many of his closest friends one of whom was ahmad so ahmad had been mentioned in this note which could have been a suicide note and Ahmad was part of the coverage, working the sideline. And Ahmad was very emotionally shaken. He was walking around uh, the bowels of Madison Square Garden before the game, trying to pull himself together. Uh, there were other people on the crew who were in tears because it became clear to them that, you know, an innocent man doesn't run. Did OJ really do this? If he didn't do it, what's the possible explanation? Is he going to kill himself? What's going to happen here? It was emotionally um, devastating to a lot of us, but it was also a test of professionalism because you got to go do your job. Did you find that part to be difficult because you knew him personally, you weren't just covering a new subject. This was a colleague, a friend. Did you find it hard to work in that moment? You did yes. a great job, but internally, did you find it difficult? Yes, um, but I, I knew that my personal feeling didn't matter uh, to the audience in that moment. It might have mattered later in a conversation like this or documentaries that you, you've mentioned. But in that moment, my job was to be as professional as I could, and I hope I accomplished that. Um, I have heard you say that um, later that you found out that at least what he said was he tried to call you and mm -hmm. uh, while in the, uh, in the Bronco and – this was pre-cell phone, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, 1994. Right. Um, you call your home. You're, you know, you're obviously not at the studio. Called the studio as well. Just curious, um, if this was the cell phone era and you had a cell phone and he called your cell phone, 
as a journalist and also, you know, as someone who knew how dire the situation was, mm -hmm. do you think you guys would have put him live on the air? If he was willing to go on, I think we would have. And then the question, a difficult needle to thread, is what would the questioning have been? Right. And I have thought about that because he did apparently try to contact me. Some people had cell phones then. I didn't. I'm kind of a technophobe. I didn't come around until many years after that. And apparently he called my house in St. Louis and there was no answer. And then he tried the studio because the same studio where he had been part of our team for covering the NFL was the studio from which we did the NBA. But in this case, because it was the finals, we were at the site, Madison Square Garden, so there was nobody there. Um, so apparently he tried uh, on a couple of occasions to reach me. Uh, and when I later visited him, in the L.A. County Jail in November of 94, A.C. Cowlings was there, uh, and he brought this up to me. To me, it had just been a rumor prior to that, and I didn't place much stock in it. But A.C. said, we tried to call you from the back of the Broncos. So I know that it's true. Um, if somehow there had been the possibility of a connection, I think a couple of things would have to have happened. I would have to have said in my own way what the police detectives were trying to say to him, and you can hear it on, on all the, the audio of that. OJ, think about your mom, think about your kids, put the gun down. Uh, you'll have a chance uh, to be well represented. You'll have a good defense. If you haven't done this, you'll be able to make your case in court. Please put the gun down. That would have to be part of it. But another part would have to be as gently as possible. OJ, did you do this? Now, whatever his answer was, then the next question would be, if you didn't do it, why wouldn't you just stand trial and state your case? You realize this doesn't look good. First, you, you ran, and now you, you, whatever you're doing, this isn't helping. I think I would have had to have said that, as difficult as it might have been, and as much as some portion of the audience might have resented it, I think that would have been done as delicately as possible that would have been the journalistically responsible thing to do but it's all just you know theoretical now because it never happened two years prior uh, we had the 90, 1992 summer olympic games notable for basketball fans because of the dream team but also notable for you because it was your first time hosting the the primetime show for nbc so a massive one which began a, a long you know string of uh, hosting duties as far as the olympics are concerned. Um, obviously, a lot has been said about that team, but for you, is there a moment, a story that comes to mind when you think of that team and their impact back then? But also, here we are, thirty years later, and you're seeing, you know, you're yeah. seeing the byproduct of it all with the Donchiches of the world and, and the international explosion. When, when you when you think back, is is there something that we weren't privy to, perhaps behind the scenes, that just spoke to how big of a deal that was in '92? I don't know if it's behind the scenes, but it's just an affirmation of David Stern's vision and what a brilliant commissioner he was. He was going to take the game global. And that was an, ex an extremely important piece of that plan, the dream team on that global stage. And the teams that the U.S. romped over didn't seem to mind very much. Uh, I can't remember the name of the player but or which nation it was, but somebody wanted a picture while the game was going on the ball went out of bounds and this player from whatever team was losing by 35 points or whatever it is wanted a picture with charles barkley the two of them wound up chasing the ball to the sideline and someone was there with a with a camera and he wanted that picture uh and i also remember uh the u.s against angola and i guess this also involved barkley uh who decided he was playing in a street game and this skinny and Golan player tried to box him out or something, and Charles pushed him, and people thought that th that was uncalled for. And Charles, you know, ever humorous, was like, hey, you know, you come into the lane with me, that's what's going to happen, whether we're in the schoolyard or whether we're in Barcelona at the Olympics. Um, and this is pretty random, but I also remember throwing it uh, to Marv and Mike Fratello for one of the games. Um, and it may again have been Angola, uh, and Marv's line was, uh, Bob, you'll be interested to know that bookmakers in Luanda have taken this one off the board, <laughs> which pretty much summed it up. 
That is a tremendous uh, imitation, by the way. Well done, or impersonation. Um, by the way, speaking of Charles Barkley, you knew him well in those in in those days, the '90s. He was obviously a, a big star, MVP in '93. Did you have any sense that he would turn into the the analyst that he has become? Like, could you, you know, uh, he was he was polarizing the commercials. I'm not a role model, but did you think he would turn into this? No one could have anticipated the magnitude of it, but you knew for sure that he had star power, that he had tremendous star power. We always loved to have him on. He was always loose in interviews, whether in person or by satellite. Uh, when his team was knocked out of the playoffs, then we always wanted him on some of our shows as the playoff coverage continued. So I, I thought he had the makings of a television star. No question about it. Uh, Dick Ebersol wanted to bring him over uh, to NBC as soon as he retired. But could we have predicted this level of stardom uh, where he's one of the very few voices now in television sports that really moves the needle, that really makes a difference? Uh, I don't know that I was smart enough to predict that, but I had a pretty good sense that that he was a television natural. I think we all did. A lot of people remember you going toe to toe with Vince McMahon on HBO and, uh, and and the subsequent you know follow up interview, which wasn't as heated but still very memorable. One thing I always remembered about you, and as someone who always looked up to interviewers, that was the thing that I I was really infatuated with. I, I loved the art of interviewing, as as kind of corny as that may sound. You used to be tough on David Stern. Uh, you used, I remember you. I remember thinking like, wow, these are hard questions. And not, you know, David didn't do a lot of interviews back then, but, and there wasn't a thousand channels, but I would remember the, yeah. you know, you, you guys went at, and, and I know about the stories. I've never met him, never, you know, obviously he's no longer with us, that he, he did have a bit of a temper. Did you ever find yourself in hot water? Did you ever get the phone call afterwards from David Stern no. saying like, why did you ask me this? None of that. No, in fact, David appreciated it. Hmm. He used to say to me during the course of the season, after the first one that we did, uh, which I think was in 93, uh, during the finals between the Suns and the Bulls, and it got a little bit contentious because there were issues then surrounding Michael Jordan's gambling on golf and whatnot, and that was topical. So uh, I had to present those questions to the commissioner, and it did get a little contentious. Uh, but after that, um, he would say, when are we going to do our interview? Are you getting ready for the interview? And the interview always took place during the finals. Getting those questions ready. Uh, so I think we both appreciated it. Look, David Stern's one of the smartest guys I ever met in sports. He was uh, a lawyer of some renown. The idea that he'd be overmatched by me in a back and forth is ridiculous. He actually looked forward to it because he knew that I'd be well prepared. and He knew the questions would be responsible. I think actually it was my good friend Dick Ebersol who was kind of been out of shape the first time because Dick was, uh, I think, concerned with protecting his partnership with David Stern and the NBA and wouldn't want me to be too hard on him. But I think that David convinced him and Dick came to understand himself that it was only once a year and it was responsible. Same kind of questions you would ask if he was uh, the guest on Meet the Press. And it didn't hurt the NBA's popularity in any way. And besides, 95% of the time, uh, whether as a play-by-play -play man or as the studio guy, I was helping to dramatize uh, and amplify the theater of the NBA, not just because it was my job, but because I honestly believed in it. It was such a wonderful era. I believed in all that excitement and drama. I, I had goosebumps before those big games came on the air and I heard the NBA on, on NBC theme. But I've always felt whether it was basketball or baseball or the Olympics or whatever it is, you have to acknowledge the elephants in the room. There has to be an element of journalism, and it actually lends credibility to the rest of it when you say, hey, isn't this terrific? If you're already on record as acknowledging that no matter how great something is, there's always some issues. There's always some possible flaws. If you're able to acknowledge those things, I think you have greater credibility when in the next breath you say, hey, there's no place I'd rather be than right here. And both of those things were true of me uh, in our coverage of the NBA. How do you feel about the current state of NBA broadcasting? I don't just mean play by play, but the whole presentation, what we are seeing right now. Do you, do you, do you consume it? I think the broadcasting is excellent. I do watch it. Maybe not as much in total as I used to, but I definitely follow it. 
Um, I think that Mike Breen is a fabulous play-by-play guy. He's already in the broadcaster's wing of the Basketball Hall of Fame. And he's earned that. He's a great successor to Marv Albert as the national voice of the NBA. The studio show on TNT with Ernie Johnson and Kenny Smith and Shaq and, of course, Charles Barkley is the best studio show in the history of American sports television. It's just fantastic. So and then there are other broadcasters whose voices are heard on NBA games nationally. Kevin, Kevin Harlan and. Ian Eagle and others, they're all very, very good. Um, What can't be replicated, as we said at the beginning of this interview, is the circumstances of the NBA and the television landscape of the 90s. That's not their fault. On their own terms, in the present, they're doing a great, great job. Any particular... Uh, story like right now that you're watching that you enjoy that you're like oh this is a team that I have to watch this is a player that I particularly love watching is there anything that really sticks out to you in this current product well you know this is kind of an obvious answer but I think Steph Curry is the player with all due respect to LeBron James who's a multi-generational player but there's something poetic about the way Steph Curry plays he's just so pleasing to watch And as is true of many great players in other sports, one of the tests is if you took someone who'd never been to an NBA game and didn't know anything about it and sat him or her down in a good courtside seat, where would their eyes go? Their eyes in the past would have gone to Michael Jordan or to Magic Johnson. I think your eyes now go to Steph Curry, even if you didn't know anything about his scoring average or his three-point accuracy and didn't know a a pick and roll from a free throw, your eyes would go to Steph Curry. He's not just great. He's very, very pleasing to watch. And I think that, you know, players like Jokic and and Luka Doncic have interesting multifaceted games, which also make them uh, very interesting to watch. Um, I won't keep you much longer. Are you cool for a a few more questions? Sure. Okay, great. Um, Your introduction into basketball, of course, was with the uh, the late great St. Louis Spirits of the ABA, and mm-hmm. it's amazing looking back. You know, if you're if you're an old time fan, which I consider myself, you know, Marvin Barnes, Moses Malone, Maurice Lucas, Don Chaney, Rod Thorne as as coach. I mean, it's really a who's who. Uh, I feel like a movie should be made about that team in particular. Who would mm-hmm. you comp- and 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 Bad News Barnes in particular, a great character for for someone that may not know these names. Is there anyone in the league now or maybe in the last 10, 15 years that you compare Bad News Barnes to? Is Because that, that to me is just like a classic 70s character yeah. or is he incomparable? You know, I should have a comparison, at least a rough comparison, because I'm often asked about Marvin Barnes to somebody playing today. But the game itself has changed so much uh, that I don't know that there's an apt comparison. But I will say that for his time, Marvin was, if not unique, he was unusual. He was 6'9", but he had a handle. He had an outside game and an inside game. Players didn't bulk up the way they do today. Weight training was not a thing. So he was 6'9", and probably, you know, a lean uh, 215, 220, something like that. Um, But he was a fabulous player. He was also a fabulous and also sometimes very, very frustrating and self-destructive character. But in his first year in the league, it was also Moses Malone's first year in the league. In fairness to Moses, he came right out of high school and Marvin played four years at Providence. But nonetheless, Marvin Barnes was the rookie of the year, not Moses Malone, who went on to become a three-time NBA MVP. And there were nights when Dr. J was on the floor with Marvin Barnes and the best player on the floor was Marvin Barnes. He could do everything. He could score. He could rebound. When his head was in the game, he could really defend. He was a great player. And had he stayed on anything like the straight and narrow, I am certain that he would have been on the court at the All-Star game in 97 in Cleveland when they named the 50 greatest players. And that would have carried over to this past year when they named the 75 greatest players. He was that good. Um, He was also outrageously funny. It was hard to stay mad at him, but in the big picture, you had to stay concerned about him because he squandered all that talent and wound up dying young. 
I've never held this against you. Uh, I would have done the same thing, but you left Syracuse to take that job, right? Syracuse yeah. University. You never graduated. Did you ever right. consider finishing up your degree? I would have considered it, but circumstances never made it uh, a practical thing to do. I was very, very lucky. Uh, I think I made the right decision. I know I did uh, to leave, not just for a job, but a job in St. Louis on a 50,000 watt radio station, one of the great stations ever, KMOX, home of Jack Buck and later Joe Buck and Harry Carey and back in the day and Joe Garagiola and Gary Bender and Dan Deardorff. I mean, it was really a cradle of sports broadcasters. Dan Kelly, who was the Doc Emmerich of his day, the greatest hockey announcer of his generation, called the St. Louis Blues. It was just a great place to be. So I would have been crazy not to uh, to leave Syracuse and take that job. Um, and it, I never really had the opportunity where I could have said, look, I'm going to go back and spend a semester on campus and make up those 12 credits or whatever it would have been. And my relationship with Syracuse has, con has continued just the same. Um, so I'm involved in, in many things, as you know, and you were there when I came back, as I did regularly to speak to classes and, and whatnot. So they certainly treat me as one of their own. And and now I'm part of what is a very long line of Syracuse sports broadcasters, which began with Marty Glickman way back in the day and now extends not just to the dozens, but into the hundreds. I can't I can hardly turn around without bumping into somebody in the business who says, hey, Bob. I went to Syracuse. I went to Newhouse. So, yeah, it's a source of pride to be part of that lineage. And, and just curious, because I've certainly experienced this, and I'm wondering if you ever did, especially in those early days, St. Louis, or even your cup of coffee uh, with WGN, um, mm -hmm. with those uh, Bulls teams. Well, it really was like, I think it was like 19 road games in 1970, yeah. 80, before you went to uh, to NBC. Did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome? Like, you're a young guy, you look even younger, and you're surrounded by you know, these, these larger than life characters and think like, how did I end up here? Do I belong here? Did you ever, you, you always come across as very calm, cool and collected on air, even dating back to those days. But did you ever feel like you didn't belong and had to fake it? At the very beginning, Ariel, yes. Uh, especially because as you said, not only was I just 22, I looked like I was 15. I had almost no credentials. Um, I'm, rubbing shoulders with, not actually working with, but rubbing shoulders with Jack Buck and others. And in looking back, I think there were times when I tried to sound authoritative and maybe be more serious than my actual personality would have led me to be because I wanted to prove that I belonged, that I wasn't just an immature kid. But it was actually after doing some things that were more lighthearted, uh, there was a, a morning guy on KMOX who was legendary in St. Louis named Jack Carney. And he put me on his shows and he wasn't really that much of a sports fan, but he liked me and he would do funny things with me and put me on the spot. And I, maybe I had some responses that he thought were funny. And that introduced me to the audience in a different way and helped to loosen me up. And the same thing happened at NBC. When I first got there again, uh, looking young was even more of an issue because this was television not radio. You know, I'm on the same staff, at least in theory, with Dick Enberg and Don Crickey and other really great and established sports broadcasters. But early on, lucky for me, like a year into my NBC tenure, maybe two, um, David Letterman has me on his show, which was just starting in late night on NBC in 1982. And the reason he had me on was he was looking for Marv Albert. He was looking for Don Crick. He was looking for somebody else who the audience would recognize to do some kind of mock sportscast thing. Uh, elevator races, one of the many goofy things that, that he did that became one of his trademarks. And none of them were around. And they said, well, we got Bob Costas here. And they needed somebody. And to show you what the state of affairs was, when David introduced me, he introduced me as Bob Costa. But... <laughs> I got it. I got what he wanted. He wanted this mock, reverential, hyper serious, like you're overlooking the 18th green at Augusta or it's the uh, the last game of the World Series. He wanted that while covering this ridiculous elevator race. And so I knew what he wanted. I'd been a fan of his from his appearances with Johnny Carson. And I guess I did all right on that occasion. And David liked me. And he brought me back, not just um that night uh but subsequently 
And going on David Letterman and having people respond favorably to it had the same effect as the radio appearances in St. Louis. It loosened me up and it, it em emboldened me that it would be OK for me to be a little bit more irreverent and have my real personality come out. And then when that, you know, kind of was added to the basics of the play by play, then I think that people had a different feeling about me and it helped my career. Do you have a favorite call? You know, I think part of your job is, and I may not be the same as other broadcasters, you want to capture the facts and the details of the moment. But if the moment is bigger than just that game or just that play, you hope you'll be able to say something that will hold up down the line. So the call of Michael Jordan's last shot to win the championship in 98 uh, for the Bulls over the Jazz, I think that holds up pretty well. One that may not seem like all that much, but the Yankees swept the Braves in 99 in the World Series. And coming into that World Series, the Yankees had won the two world championships. The Braves had won one, but the Braves were in the World Series for the fifth time. So if the Braves had won that World Series, they would have been the team of the decade. They would have had the five pennants and the two World Series, and they would have split two World Series with the Yankees. So that was kind of the way that World Series was framed when we came on the air. The Yankees wind up sweeping them. The last out was a routine fly ball to left. And I said, the New York Yankees, world champions, team of the decade, most successful franchise of the century. And that I didn't say anything for like the next two minutes because it was a home game for the Yankees. So the crowd is going nuts and they're celebrating on the field. And the reason why I remember it is that, you know, lots of teams play compilations of their franchise highlights before the game during batting practice or whatever for early arriving fans. And so being at Yankee Stadium, the call game subsequently, I've probably heard it a dozen times since then. And it passes that test in that it sums it up. It sums up not just that the game is over and the Yankees have swept the series. It sums up, it kind of punctuates what that moment meant. It ended the century of Yankee dominance. So, you know, that's a pretty good one, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, two last quick ones, if I may. Um, number one, before you call it a career, and uh, hopefully it's it's 30 more years of Bob Costas in our lives. If, if, we're, if we're into 30 more years, we're into uh, me being a cent, a, what is it, a centenarian, a centenarian. Yeah, that's great. Why not? Yeah, uh, I, I don't, th I don't think either I or the world needs that. But, <laughs> but another four or five would be okay. Fair enough, uh, and I look forward to those. Uh, would you like to call an NBA game or two? Would you like to be on an NBA broadcast, or are, are you good? No, I'm good. I'm, I'm good with what I've done. Uh, I left the Olympics when I was a still young, sixty-four, and that was by design. Um, I was inclined to leave it sooner than that. But when the Comcast people took over, um, they said, you know, we would like you. You're an important part of the blah, blah, blah. They were very nice. Um, and so they said, we need you on Sunday Night Football and on the Olympics. And I said, OK, this was 2012. I said, it all ends in 2016. 2016 is my 12th and last Olympics. And it's the last year that I'll be a regular part of Sunday Night Football. Uh, and then they crafted this emeritus role for me. And occasionally I contributed things uh, to other aspects of their coverage, but I was never the main guy anymore. And I was perfectly good with that. In fact, that was by design. And the only thing that I really wanted to concentrate on after that on a limited basis was baseball because the baseball network existed then. And I'd been part of it since its inception in 2009. And that has always felt like a good fit on a limited basis. Did I want to do a hundred games or a full schedule? Of course not. But for example, coming into this year, I'll wind up doing 10 or 12 games for MLB. I'll do a half dozen regular season games for TBS. And then I'll do one of the two national league division series uh, for TBS in October. And I can do that on that limited basis for another few years. And, and that's fine. And then maybe after that, uh, I guess I could always be useful as long as I have my wits about me when it comes to historical things or Hall of Fame inductions or issues that crop up in sports, interviews, that kind of thing. I think I can still hold my own there. Uh, but I don't really I don't really have that many itches left 
to scratch. And I'm very happy and feel very fortunate to be, have been able to do all the things that I, that I was able to do. I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. Lastly, um, I've never asked anyone this question, and uh, I think you're the only person that I would ask this to. I interview, on average, 12 to 14 people a week for the various shows that I do, and I've been doing that for a long time, and I've never asked this, and, and I probably would never ask it to anyone else. In your opinion, because I think you're one of the great interviewers, sports or not, of my lifetime, and in your show later, we could do a whole other interview mm -hmm. on, on that alone, and I know that was a big source of pride for you. Yes. What was the key? Um, one, maybe more comes to mind, would love to hear them all to a great interview, because I always loved like you, you, you were like a sniper out there, you know, you short to the point, like even after this, I always hate my performances. I, I stumble I this, I that I should have asked this. I zigged when I should have zagged, but I always felt like you were on point. You asked the questions you got in and out, like a boxer throwing a jab, always well-researched, well-spoken, never stumbled, but it was just like the short, concise questions to the point, didn't beat around the bush. I saw an interview that you did recently with, uh, well, I, I watched it recently, but it was 20 years ago with LeBron James when he was mm -hmm. about to get drafted. And the questions you were asking him were tough, but they were respectful and professional, but they were to the point. What, in your opinion, comes to mind when I ask you, like the key to a great interview that you believed in strongly had to be involved in the process? Well, first of all, you have nothing to apologize for, either for the questions themselves or for the presentation. You've done very well here. I um, preparation is always part of it. And then it almost sounds contradictory. You've got to be willing in any given moment to toss the preparation aside. Uh, the, pr the interviewer who is locked into question four because he's just asked question three is not going to be all that good. You have to be prepared. You have to ask the right questions, but then you have to listen because what the person says might demand challenge. It might demand clarification or amplification. Hey, I didn't know that. Tell me more. But also you have to recognize the difference. I don't think that every question I asked was like a quick jab. I think sometimes, depending on whether it was a long form interview or a shorter interview, some questions require some background. For example, on later, you didn't have the kind of setup piece that you'd have uh, for other network interviews where the essential two or three minutes of the background of the person or what the issue at stake is, is laid out. And then the interview begins. Later began with, thanks for staying up later. Our guest tonight is so-and-so. And in some cases, I had to, in the question, lay out, well, You've won three Academy Awards, and yet I understand it's one for which you wasn't even nominated. You weren't even nominated. That is uh, the one that you hold most dear. Uh, some background was required. So sometimes questions were longer, but it was to set the stage for the appropriate answer and to let the audience in on what the background was so that they would appreciate it. Um, you had to recognize the difference between an interview like that, which was 22 minutes minus the commercials, and sometimes if the guest was interesting enough, we'd carry him or her over for a second or even a third interview. That's a different aspect of the craft than being on the Today Show like Brian Gumbel or whomever, and you've got somebody for three minutes, four minutes, maybe if it's really long by the standards of the Today Show, eight, nine, ten minutes, that's a whole different thing. you got to cut to the chase immediately with those. In long-form interviews, like this one, for example, sometimes the best stuff comes toward the end, not so much from a probing question, but because you've won the trust of the interview subject. They know you're prepared. You've been respectful. And then they just give it up. You didn't really expect it. You didn't pry it out of them. They just went there and said something interesting. So I guess like with anything, it's a recognition of the circumstances, uh, but preparation is always an important part of it. But then the willingness to be spontaneous, if someone says something unexpected, to go down that unexpected road rather than just rigidly sticking with what you think you had prepared and what you thought was going to happen. What a thrill. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, really, one of the the highlights of my career, getting a chance to talk to you, and uh, 25 years ago or so, I never would have imagined this. So thank you for all this time. I could have uh, peppered you with questions for the next three hours, but I will not subject you to that. <laughs> uh, 
uh, congratulations on an unbelievable Hall of Fame, legendary, iconic career. And I can't wait for three, four, five more years, how many ever you want to give to us. Uh, they are they are very much appreciated on this end. And thanks for showing, you know, younger broadcasters like myself the way to do it, the proper way to do it with some, you know, some humor, serious professionalism, journalism. Uh, you, you did it all. And uh, again, I, I can't thank you enough for, for today, but also for, for the body of work. Truly well, a great pleasure to talk to you and an honor. I can't thank you enough for being so kind and for saying so many nice things. I hope that at least some of them were deserved. And when it comes to this interview, I think you aced it. So uh, I appreciate you it. ought to feel good about it yourself. Thank you, Bob. All the best to you. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.